The next item of business is a statement by Jean Freeman on transvaginal mesh update. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Jean Freeman, Cabinet Secretary, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to update members on the progress of our work in respect to transvaginal mesh. In doing so, I want to thank all those involved in the Scottish Mesh Survivors Group for their tireless campaigning and members across this chamber who have supported them. In September 2018, I announced my decision to halt the use of transvaginal mesh in cases of both pelvic organ prolapse and stress urinary incontinence. I set out that I required high vigilance from boards to ensure that this was implemented and that such a halt would only be lifted if a restricted use protocol could be developed to my satisfaction. Our Chief Medical Officer, Dr Catherine Calderwood, duly instructed health boards on this restriction to practice and in compliance with my statement, established a group of board accountable officers to consider aspects of service and care available to women suffering from stress urinary incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse. That group has met once. The minutes are published on the Scottish Government website. To be as clear as possible, I can see no prospect of the halt I instigated being lifted and I have not asked for any planning to lift that halt. I wrote to the Chief Executive of the MHRA, that's the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, on the 31st of October 2018 and the CMO has been in contact with their medical director, or their director of medical devices on, uh, in November and in December followed by a phone call in December. In these exchanges, we have raised our concerns on their approvals process, and I hope that we have not only been listened to, but understood. MHRA have set out that they take these views extremely seriously and have invited NHS Scotland to join all cross-cutting initiatives, including in the work on the unique device identifier and the improved communication with patients on the potential outcomes from the use of all types of medical devices. MHRA say they stand ready to support us and our healthcare system to ensure the, patient of, the safety of patients needing treatment. I'm sure members across this chamber will join me in ensuring that we hold them to that commitment. In March this year, following a member's debate, I and the CMO met with a group of women from the Mesh Survivors Group. I'm grateful to them for their time and for their courage and willingness to share their experiences with me. Following that meeting, I set and trained the work I had promised the women I would. A MESH Complications Short Life Group was set up to consider the following. The physical and psychological needs of the women who experience complications. What additional steps are needed to offer choice to women who are clinically suitable for and want MESH removal. Review and identify areas of best practice wherever it happened and determine how these can be provided in Scotland. In addition, and again, in line with the commitment I gave, I ensured that the voices of women would be heard in that short life group's deliberations. Through the membership of Dr. Will Agur, who the MESH survivors group wanted to represent them, and the Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland. As members will be aware, detail on this has been set out by me in four government-inspired questions on the 8th of March, the 6th of June, the 13th of June, and an update provided on the 19th of June. A key part of the MESH complication work, Complications Working Group's actions is to ensure that the care and treatment provided for women affected is as good, if not better, than that offered in any other centre, either here in the UK or elsewhere around the world. This requires benchmarking processes and outcomes with other centres, as well as sharing experience and techniques with clinicians. In this context, Dr. Veronica's offer to come to Scotland to work is very welcome, and I also recognise that a number of patients are eager for him to come here. As a result, and in consultation with the service here in Scotland, I have asked that we look to bring Dr. Veronikis to Scotland as soon as possible. The, attention, the intention will be for him to work with the clinical service in a complementary fashion to provide treatment, expert advice and training. I want this to be a valued partnership 
that benefits patients now and over the long term. In saying all of this, it is important that we are all clear that such an arrangement is subject to agreement and regulatory approval. As regulation in this area is reserved, I have written to the UK Government's Health Secretary and to the General Medical Council to highlight this case and ask that for their part, steps are taken forward as expeditiously as possible. I'm pleased that the GMC have responded quickly and positively with an assurance that they will do all they can to ensure the important regulatory process is completed quickly and smoothly. With appropriate agreement and sponsorship by the service, I hope Dr. Veronikas can visit by the autumn. I await a response from the UK Government. The MESH Complications Working Group have also work, been working to establish a National Complex Case Review Unit within NHS Scotland. The work to finalise the details and the important connections between this unit and the relevant health board is being taken forward through our service design processes with the intention that it is established by mid-2020. The working group have also taken forward a number of other measures designed to ensure patients do have choice and all the information they need to exercise that choice, including establishing clear care pathways, including through primary care, as well as in acute services that are consistent across Scotland. Presiding officer, I want to repeat my thanks to the Scottish Mesh Survivors Group. Their initial work and campaigning was to ensure that no other woman in the future suffered the pain and life-changing effects of mesh use that they had and still do. The halt I instructed last September responded directly to that. But the women rightly then sought the attention and care they themselves are due. From all the correspondence I have received from the representations made to me from members here, and most importantly from the women themselves, I understood clearly the areas where the care and attention and choice that is offered could be improved. The update I've provided today directly responds to that. Our health service is there to provide safe, effective and person-centered care. In this area and for those women who suffer complications from MESH, my intention is that what I have set out today takes us ever closer to providing that focused, safe and person-centred care. I commend this update to Parliament, Presiding Officer, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. As the Cabinet Secretary said, you'll now take questions on a statement. We've got about 20 minutes for questions, and then we'll move on to the next item of business. As usual, apart from two front benches, I'd ask other members to be uh, crisp in their questions as far as possible for everybody in. Miles Briggs, we followed by Monica Lynn. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advanced sight of her statement today. Like the Scottish Mesh, Survi Mesh Survivors Group, I believe there's cross-party support for the development of a clinical service to provide treatment expert advice and training opportunities here in our country. And the Cabinet Secretary will have the support of these benches in taking that work forward. But can I ask specifically um, of the Cabinet Secretary, what training budgets will be made available to help take forward the training time and capacity which will be needed by Dr. Veronicus to take forward new techniques and technology which can finally offer and provide full mesh removal for women and patients here in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank Mr Briggs? I'm grateful to him for uh, the support of his benches for the work that is undertaken uh, and indeed um, to Mr Carlaw who has been one of the prominent members in pursuing the case for the MESH uh, survivors and the women involved. In terms of training budget, so where we are at the moment is that we are in discussion with Dr Veronikis. Um, part of what would sensibly be done is that um, the right group of our clinicians will uh, go to the US shortly uh, to uh, speak with him, to see what he uses by way of equipment and so on, to discuss with him how they will work together and what they think their training needs are. He, I hope then, with due regulatory process completed um, and with the support of the GMC, that's very helpful, uh, will then uh, arrange to come to Scotland. Uh, there are limitations to the length of time over a time period that uh, an external expert can come and practice in our country, but uh, that will all be resolved and he, we will uh, agree those arrangements with him. And then, uh, on the basis of all of that, then I will understand better 
what is needed by way of training uh, in terms of our clinicians, his time, uh, both when we visit him in the States and also when he comes here, and therefore what additional uh, funding might be made available. What, so I, at this point, because of all those reasons, I can't give you that figure, but what I can give you is my absolute commitment that we will ensure that what is needed is provided uh, and that our clinicians, uh, where it, it is appropriate, will be learning from him and exchanging good practice with him. Monica Lennon, followed by Alec Neil. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of her statement. The Mesh injured women of Scotland continue to live with the life-changing consequences of this medical scandal. The Cabinet Secretary says that she hopes Dr Veronicus can visit by the autumn. However, Dr Veronicus offered to come to Scotland as far back as November 2018. A flurry of correspondence now to make this happen is a little disappointing because autumn is no use to women like Claire Daisley, a mother of three from Greenock, who is set to lose her bowel and her bladder next month. Claire's body is swelling up because of her mesh injuries and she's basically trapped in her own home. Can the Health Secretary tell Claire Daisley and other women in her position if they will have surgery from Dr Veronicus before it's too late? And will the Scottish Government fund Claire to have her surgery in America, where Dr Veronicus is based, if that's what it takes? Cameron Secretary. Um, I'm grateful to Ms Lennon for her question. I'm disappointed, though, however, I have to say at uh, the parsimonious nature of, uh, of that. Um, if, if, and I will answer the question, Mr Finlay, there really is no need to shout at me if you want to ask me a question. I suggest you press your button and get up in your pins. Can I say, presiding order, officer... Order, please. Order, please. Let the Cabinet Secretary speak, please. Can I say that if you understood how a health service works, you would understand that the important thing, the steps you have to go through are to have those discussions with clinicians, to understand what their needs are, to have the further conversations and the due diligence done on any external expert that we wish to come here. And that is why we are now fortunately in the situation that we are. In terms of uh, the situation uh, with Ms Daisley, uh, as uh, I believe um, members may know, the CMO has had a conversation with Ms Daisley. It is a clinical decision as to whether anyone is uh, suitable for full mesh removal. Uh, I am not going to discuss an individual case, case in this chamber. Uh, that will be for the board and Ms Daisley uh, to take further. Uh, and any other matters that arise from that, I will, of course, look at it. The important point here is that from the meeting I had with the women uh, representing the Mesh Survivors Group in March, everything that I undertook with them, I would do, I have now done. Thank you, Carl. Alec Neal to be followed by Jackson Carlo. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I welcome this statement by the Cabinet Secretary and congratulate her on the work that she's doing to you? Uh, rectify a long-lasting injustice to these women. Uh, can I ask her, with respect to the Mesh Complications Working Group, if it is yet in a position to estimate the number of women who could benefit from the establishment of this group? And also, can I ask if, meantime, because clearly it will take probably up till about the middle of next year to fully establish such a unit, uh, if I can ask what the interim arrangements are for women with complications who require urgent treatment. Cabinet Secretary. So, as, as Mr. I'm grateful to Mr Neil for the question. In terms of estimating the number of women who are experiencing mesh, mesh complications, the detailed, planning, the detailed planning for the development of the complex case unit will be able to take forward um, more rigorous estimation of demand at the moment uh, the work that is going on is estimating these figures from our current knowledge uh, and uh, using estimates indeed from NHS England uh, and all of that we will put together in terms of the planning process once it is finalised. Uh, as Mr uh, Neil will know, part of the difficulty was the work that I referred to uh, is now being taken forward thanks to our intervention with the MHRA which is to have that unique device identifier and to have that registry, which I announced uh, back in September, that uh, registry in Scotland and uh, across the UK developed, which will give us much better, better data in that regard. So the work is underway, but we are not yet in a position to be completely confident 
that our estimate of the numbers uh, is as uh, accurate as we would wish it to be. The uh, point that Mr uh, Neil wants to make is has made about in anticipation of the complex case review unit uh, being established, what is the situation? I have set out uh, uh, for uh, individual cases where people have been in touch with me, exactly what the process is uh, in terms of the choice and how you can exercise that choice. But in addition, uh, the short life group that we set up to look at these matters following my meeting with the women in uh, the beginning of March is uh, clearly establishing a pathway with each relevant health board so that they know uh, and can respond quickly to requests for uh, second opinions and to requests for a uh, choice uh, about where mesh removal might be undertaken. Thank you. Jackson Carlo, to be followed by Neil Findlay. Jackson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Whatever differences there might be over the overall shape of health care, can I congratulate the Cabinet Secretary really on a series of actions she has taken in her year as Health Secretary, in contrast actually to the years of frustration experienced by mesh sufferers uh, in the years previous to that. I've had women in tears uh, having campaigned to stop mesh as a future condition, uh, now in real expectation that there is something that can be done for them. In consequence, expectations are sky high. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, how confident is she that the discussions now underway with Dr. Veronicus will lead to a successful conclusion? And secondly, what, if anything, can Scottish Conservatives do to assist regarding any support required to achieve objectives with the UK Government. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank uh, Jackson Carlow for uh, his kind comments uh, and for his support, and as I said earlier, um, for the work that he and others have undertaken to raise and consistently raise this issue. I am confident that the current discussions will lead to a successful conclusion. In terms of uh, both uh, Dr. Veronique is coming here. Um, I'm very clear that I want that to be, in terms of his expert advice, the treatment of patients uh, and training, so that any skills and techniques uh, that he has that would usefully be acquired by our clinicians uh, are passed on. Uh, and that we look at long-term training uh, for clinicians, of course, and not just the immediate situation. In terms of anything that the Scottish Conservatives uh, can do to assist us, I'm very grateful for that offer. Um, I, I await a reply from um, the Secretary of State for Health. I, I understand that there are other things happening in terms of the UK government at this point. Uh, I'm, I'm not trying to uh, make anything other than a statement of fact. Uh, if I think that is taking a wee bit too long, then I would certainly call on uh, uh, Mr. Carlo and others uh, to give the nudge in the appropriate direction. And perhaps even at this point, they can simply raise with the Secretary of State, we've had a very speedy reply from the GMC, and I, it would be good to get a positive reply from the UK Government. Thank you. Neil Findlay, followed by Rona Mackay. President Officer, I remind the Chamber, we're only having this statement because Labour demanded it, but I very warmly welcome very warmly welcome the progress on bringing Dr Veronicus to Scotland. It appears that campaigning and pressure works and that is a very good thing. But something does not stack up with this because on the 20th of June, I asked the Cabinet Secretary about any plans to bring back MESH. She said in her answer, and I quote, I, ha I have not instructed any planning to consider lifting that halt and the Scottish Government has undertaken no work to that effect. Now, minutes from the Accountable Officers Group of the 22nd of February say, and I quote, with the publication of key guidance later in the year, it will be helpful to look at how the reintroduction of the surgical service will work in practice, and later that primary mesh operations could be undertaken in individual boards. President Officer, the Cabinet Secretary has either lied to the women in Scotland lie to this Mr. parliament Findlay, Mr. or she Findlay, hasn't Mr. a clue Findlay, what Mr. the Findlay, chief Findlay, medical officer Mr. is doing Findlay, on her please, behalf Mr. which Findlay. one is it mr Findlay, there are there is a certain amount of language you can use in this chamber and lying is not a term we allow so please withdraw that remark and ask your question in a polite way to the cabinet secretary without using that term presiding officer i would have thought the person exposing the mistruths and lies that have been told would be protected Findlay, and the person who has done me, it would be thrown out. Mr Finlay, the word is not acceptable in this chamber. You can't make accusations like that, personal accusations across the chamber. 
Uh, I'll, I'll let Mr Finlay think about this. In the meantime, we're going to move on to the next question. Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary expand on how the voices of MESH survivors have been heard during the process of establishing the complex case unit? And can she reassure them that they will remain involved in this process? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm grateful to uh, Ms Mackay for the question. Um, uh, as I said in the statement, after the meeting on the 5th of March uh, with the women, uh, I said that I would do what I then did, which was set up that short life uh, working group. Um, I asked uh, the uh, Scottish MESH survivors who they would wish to have represent them on that, if they wished to be represented directly or if they wanted that done uh, through a third party. Their response to me was that they wished uh, Dr Agur to do that for them, and so he is a member. Uh, and I've also involved uh, the Scottish uh, Care Alliance to ensure that there is a wider perspective as well in terms of patients. So they are both involved. They've been involved uh, so that those women's voices have been heard in the work that that group has developed, including the complex uh, case review unit, which uh, will be established uh, as quickly as we possibly can. And they will continue to be involved to ensure that the work that we have said we will deliver, that we actually do deliver that, and we deliver that as timelessly as possible. Thank you very much. Alison Johnson to be followed by Alice Cole Hamilton. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary's assurances that there are no plans to lift the halt on the use of transvaginal mesh. However, I am concerned by her statement that such a halt would only be lifted if a restricted use protocol could be developed. Given that the Scottish Independent Review of the Use of Transvaginal Mesh reported in March 2017 that in the surgical treatment of pelvic organ prolapse, current evidence doesn't indicate any additional benefit from the use of transvaginal implants over native tissue repair. And knowing what we know now, Cabinet Secretary, why is a reintroduction of mesh, mesh operations even being considered? Cabinet Secretary. I'm grateful to Ms Johnson for her question. If she will recall what I said in this statement uh, in that regard is exactly what I said in September when I announced my decision to halt the use of mesh in those uh, procedures. Um, and also, if uh, she will recall, the reason I wrote to the MHRA is because they are responsible for determining whether any device used is safe. And I wanted to question the degree to which they undertake that uh, process with any rigour and with any real evidence base. So I am simply being consistent with what I said in September uh, and what I've said again, and, and again, to be clear, I think I've now said this three times in this chamber, as well as in answers uh, to uh, members and in uh, government-inspired questions, uh, I can foresee no circumstance in which I will approve the reintroduction of the use of mesh. Thank you. Before, uh, before I call Mr. Colhampton, Mr. Findlay, I'm just waiting a second for you to calm down and just to regain some measure of, of control over your emotions. I understand how emotive this subject is, and I understand that members feel very strongly. However, I cannot tolerate people shouting accusations across the chamber. And I'll return to you in a second to ask you to withdraw the remark. In the meantime, please do not barrack the, the Cabinet Secretary in the middle of other members' questions. Alex Will Hamilton to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I start by welcoming today's statement in the hope that it offers all of those MASH survivors known to us in this chamber. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will recall the case of my constituent that I raised with her at a previous statement on this issue, um, who is suffering not from transvaginal MASH complications, but from hernia MASH complications. Can she clarify whether these same considerations in today's statement will be extended to those sufferers who have experienced complication in, uh, as a result from MASH in other parts of their body? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm grateful to Mr. Cole Hamilton for uh, his support and, and for his question. In terms of uh, the, that particular case uh, and the example that he gives, certainly the complex uh, case uh, unit will, will be there to look at complex cases uh, arising from complications where mesh has been used. So that is wider uh, than the particular uh, group of women and, and procedures that we're talking about at this point. In terms of uh, follow-up uh, treatment uh, for an individual in those circumstances, then of course their starting point is with their own clinician 
and with that uh, clinician's decision as to whether or not uh, it is clinically suitable to undertake those procedures. I would anticipate that the uh, training and the learning and the uh, benefit that we gain uh, from the experience of Dr. Veronikis and indeed uh, elsewhere in Europe where uh, our clinicians are currently looking, as I have asked them to do, that that will assist in uh, future uh, uh, position of NHS Scotland to deal with complications in this regard. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the statement and I'd like to ask the Cabinet Secretary to outline how the accountable officers will actually work with the primary care services to ensure that the individual cases of missed survivors are addressed. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you to uh, Mr McMillan for his question. A primary care health professional uh, has become a member of the Short Life Working Group and will canvass opinions and views uh, from professionals in primary care. Uh, these working together on the self-evaluation tool that has been completed by health boards for Healthcare Improvement Scotland's uh, Transvaginal Mesh Oversight Group provide information on any additional needs to strengthen the primary care services and pathways. So that is what I referred to in my statement about making sure that the pathway for uh, individuals in these circumstances uh, is clear, is clear to them, is clear to uh, all the clinicians who might be involved in various stages across it and is consistent across Scotland so that no matter where a person lives, they can expect the same response from healthcare professionals in their area. Thank you, I call Annie Wells to be followed by Emma Harper. Oh, sorry, big pardon. I've just jumped Stuart McMillan, really, big pardon. No, I have. Did I miss out Stuart McMillan? I did, no. Annie <laughs> Wells to be followed by Emma Harper. Annie Wells. Thank you, presenting officer. My thanks also go to the Scottish Mesh Survivors Group for their hard work, hard work campaigning on this issue and to the Cabinet Secretary for an update. And I'm also pleased to see that there's scope for Dr Veronica's to come to Scotland. Can I ask what reflections has the Cabinet Secretary had on the lessons learned? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful to Ms Wells for her question and it is an important question. I think the main ref uh, two main reflections one is that we need to pursue the work that we are now undertaking with MHRA MHR, in terms of the rigour with which uh, devices are approved for use in our healthcare system. These are devices across the piece, uh, whether it is mesh uh, or whether it is a, a hip joint or whatever, to ensure that we have a comparable rigour in that area as we do in terms of drug trials and approved drug use uh, in our health service. Uh, and the other reflection uh, that I take is the importance of, oh, it's two, it's the importance of a consistent pathway and making sure that our patients, whatever the circumstances, whatever the condition, have the maximum amount of information in order that they can make an informed decision, uh, an informed choice. That indeed is reflected in the citizens panel that the chief medical officer has run, and I'm sure you've seen the report from that, about the importance of shared decision-making. And for shared decision-making to be genuinely shared, then the individual patient has to have all the information that they need and has to have the opportunity to question and to return to those questions. So those, I would say, are the two main reflections that apply wider in our health service uh, than simply on this issue. Emma Harper to be followed by David Stewart. Thank you. Can the Cabinet Secretary further clarify whether it is her intention that clinicians in Scotland will learn from Dr Veronicus and that then the sharing of this learning will be supported and monitored, such as using a peer-reviewed approach? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, yes I can. The, the whole approach, is, as Ms Harper um, uh, says, and, and as she, I'm sure, well knows, given her background of peer review and consistent learning and exchange of experience and skills and ideas, is central uh, to uh, our health service and is undertaken right across the board. Uh, and I understand from the conversations that have already been had with uh, Dr Veronikis that that is his expectation too. So I think this will be a fruitful partnership. David Stewart to be followed by David Torrance. David Stewart. <clears throat> Thank you, President Officer. Can I also praise the work of the MESH Survivors Group? Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what work has been done to assess the number of women who would need specialist mess, mess removal operations? And if a clinical case can be made uh, for mesh damaged patients to have removal by Dr. Veronica's in the United States, 
Can this be funded by Scottish Government or NHS boards? Cabinet Secretary. So, in, in terms of understanding uh, the numbers that we may uh, be dealing with, I think I answered that already in terms of the work that's already underway to estimate that. Our data is not as good as, as we would want it to be, primarily because uh, that level of detail is not routinely gathered on procedures, and we don't yet have the individual identifier, product identifier that we're working with MHRA uh, on. And actually, uh, the fact that MHRA are working on that, I think, is largely uh, to the credit of some of the um, areas that we have pursued them on in terms of the way they approach their work. In terms of uh, whether or not uh, an individual um, can benefit from the particular treatment that Dr. Veronikis uh, offers uh, here, in, in Scotland uh, or elsewhere. Certainly part of the discussions that will go on uh, in advance of him uh, coming to Scotland, as I said, I hope that will uh, happen uh, by, the, by the autumn of this year, will be how he will undertake those clinical assessments, his access to patient records and so on, which is why we need the regulatory process to be put in place so that he is properly registered to do that and to have that access to that information. Uh, he has not, we have not discussed with him yet uh, any uh, possibility of patients uh, travelling to the US, but my answer remains uh, as it was to an earlier question, and that is, uh, that is an individual clinical decision, uh, and should that be uh, something that clinicians think is required within the time frame and in advance, then we would certainly look at that. But individual cases, um, I'm sure the member understands, uh, is not something that I would discuss in the chamber. And David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary pro provide further details of what activities Dr. Veronicus will undertake whilst here, as well as the activities of Scottish surgeons when they travel to the USA? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful to uh, Mr Torrance for that question. The areas of work have already uh, been indicated in part in my statement. They include joint, joint treatment, jointly delivered treatment, expert advice and training. The details will be further developed in the discussions uh, that my officials and clinicians are having with Dr Veronikis, and I'm happy again to ensure that members are updated on that once those conclusions are reached. The key point for me is not only treatment, but also training, so that we are building something now, not only for the current patient cohort, but uh, for any future. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Now, just before we move on, can I just return... Uh, Mr Finlay, uh, I appreciate that you feel very passionate about this subject. However, the outburst uh, earlier was not acceptable. Uh, I've given you a few minutes just to calm down and to reflect. Uh, I would ask you to withdraw the remarks you made and the accusations you made earlier. President officer, I, you know I have great respect for you and the office you hold, and I have great respect for the women who have been injured by MESH. But they have made a similar statement in the media uh, two weeks ago as to the one I made. The Cabinet Secretary has to be held to account for her actions. And with an apology to yourself, President Officer, I'm very sorry, but I cannot withdraw the comment. Um, I'm sorry, Mr Finlay, that's not acceptable. I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to leave the chamber. Thank you very much, colleagues. We're going to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion 17922 in the name of Aileen Campbell on appointments to the Poverty and Inequality Commission. And could I call on Aileen Campbell to move this motion? Formally moved. Thank you very much. And the question this will be put at decision time. Uh, the next item is consideration of business motion 17937 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Could I call on Graham Day to move this motion? Moved, President Officer. Thank you very much. And no member has asked to speak on this motion. Can I call... Sorry. So the question, therefore, is that motion 17937 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Where is Richard Lyle, may I ask? <laughs> the next item of business is consideration of business motion 17938 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on the stage one timetable of a bill. Uh, can I call on Graham Day to move this motion? Moved, President Officer. Uh, thank you very much. No one has asked uh, to speak against this motion. The question is that motion 17938 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. The next item is consideration of six parliamentary bureau motions. Can I ask Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau to move motions 
1739, 17940 and 17941 on designation of a lead committee, 17942 on a committee remit, 17943 on parliamentary recess dates and 17944 on the Office of the Clerk. Move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And our next item is consideration of a parliamentary bureau motion. And could I ask Graham Day to move motion 17945 on approval of an SSI? Moved, presiding officer. That is moved. Now, I believe Liam Kerr would like to speak against this motion. Mr Kerr. Thank you, presiding officer. Yes, I rise to speak against this SSI. This measure will bring in a presumption against courts imposing prison sentences of 12 months or less on criminals, unless there is no alternative. The underlying rationale is that Scotland has the highest prison population in Western Europe and that community-based sentences are more likely to reduce reconvictions. But the Justice Committee heard that data on populations subject to imprisonment or community sentences, their circumstances and which interventions succeeded is sorely lacking. The conclusion that community sentences inexorably lead to lower reconviction rates is, according to Professor Tata, dodgy. And the Scottish Sentencing Council were clear, it does not automatically follow that offenders who are given community sentences in lieu of three months imprisonment will show similar reconviction rates to those who would otherwise get 12 months imprisonment. Now furthermore, this presumption aims to substantially increase the numbers of criminals entering a system in which a third of sentences and two thirds of drug treatment orders are not completed in which a quarter do not involve work or meaningful activity, in which a third take longer than mandated to commence. And that in a context in which the funding and resources to community sentences are challenging. Now the Howard League said we must avoid a situation in which courts are discouraged from imposing custodial sentences, but effective community-based alternatives are unavailable. You see, presiding officer, there are better ways to reduce the reconviction rate and increase rehabilitation without the risks. We could adequ adequately resource prisons, ensure all prisoners have access to rehabilitation and perhaps look at proper housing and work upon release. We could examine the Howard League's suggestions around women in prison. We could review the use of remand. We could properly collate data on what works, why and for whom. But we haven't. Instead, this SSI imposes upon an independent judiciary. Our judges are experienced, well-trained and knowledgeable in determining the appropriate sentence. Yet this SSI will impose, without any of the individual facts of a case, a requirement on how to dispose of a sentence, having failed to ensure that sentences have trust in the alternatives and that there is a more uniform provision across Scotland. Presiding officer, I foresee this SSI going one of two ways. Either sentences will continue to hand out the sentences they think appropriate and the prison population will stay static or ironically increase due to up tariffing. Mm -hmm. In which case we've wasted time and resource whilst ignoring the real challenges and blockers to rehabilitation in the system such as lack of resources and data analysis. Or according to the government's own predictions sentences will feel pressured to put criminals whom they would otherwise have put in prison out into the community. Yeah. I fear the Scottish Government is taking a risk with the safety of the public and particularly, as Scottish Women's Aid have said, the victims of domestic abuse. I worry that, as we have heard from victims groups, victims and the public have little faith in community sentencing. And I am certain that there are better, safer and more considered ways to achieve what Parliament desires. And therefore, I urge Parliament to vote against this SSI. Can I call on the Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef to respond? <clears throat> I want a smarter justice system that reduces repeat crime by providing robust community alternatives to ineffective short prison sentences, supporting offenders to turn away from crime for good. If we can find effective alternatives to short sentences, it's not a question of pursuing a soft justice approach, but rather a case of pursuing smart justice that is effective at reducing reoffending and crime. Not my words, presiding officer, the words of the UK government's justice secretary and Tory justice secretary, David Gawk. So there is a disconnect between what conservative spokespeople up here say in Scotland and the policies being pursued by the conservative colleagues in the UK government. 
the reason for that disconnect, presiding officer, is not, frankly, that I believe that Liam Kerr has the interests and the concerns of victims in mind. Frankly, he's concerned about his next Daily Mail column, and that is just about it. He references the Howard League throughout his remarks. Of course, the Howard League are in support of this presumption against uh, short sentences of 12 months. I welcomed the committee's scrutiny of this. Of course, the committee voted overwhelmingly 7 to 2 in favour of the order, with only, of course, the Conservative members opposing it. And not only that, of course, we have increased the resources. We've protected the criminal justice social work uh, budget of 100 million. We've increased also the funding for our community alternatives. And what I would say to Liam Kerr uh, and to others that are listening that have any scepticism about the presumption is that it is a presumption, not a ban. Of course, the UK government wants to introduce a ban on sentences of six months. We are suggesting a presumption. That means that sheriffs will have discretion in sentencing. So therefore, uh, if there are any concerns about those uh, who commit offences of domestic abuse, uh, the sheriffs will still have the ability to put those people behind bars if that is what they wish to do. And that is why, of course, we waited until the training had been completed and the, effect, the new domestic abuse offence uh, came uh, into, in, into force uh, before introducing uh, this order. Uh, secondly, the point to make is that all of the research, all of the research shows that community alternatives are far more effective in rehabilitation than damaging short sentences. Yes, for some people it will be absolutely correct that the only place for them and the right place for them at that time is prison and sheriffs will have that discretion. But for the vast majority, we know that short sentences disrupt family connections, disrupt their tenancy, uh, disrupt employment opportunities. And all of these things, of course, mean that they're more likely therefore to reoffend. If they're more likely to reoffend, then of course there will be more victims of crime. If there's more victims of crime, uh, then of course uh, we have a very serious problem. And in fact, all of us here in this chamber, I think, are on the side of victims uh, here. So we want to see less victims of crime and less crime being committed. So on the last point I'd like to focus on, uh, presenting officers, instead of paying my attention to the naked opportunism of the Conservatives, is to say how delighted I am that we are in a parliament where the vast overwhelming majority of us from the Labour Party, the SNP, the Greens, the Liberal Democrats can come together, can look at the facts, can look at the data, can look at the evidence in front of us and can bring forward and support collectively progressive justice reforms that will make us all safer uh, as, a, as a country, as a society and hopefully and, and, uh, by passing this order it means we will have less victims of crime which is a win-win for everybody involved. Thank you very much. And the question on that particular motion will be the last one at decision time, to which we are now about to come. Cabinet Secretary, yes. Cabinet Secretary, Th point Thank of you order. very much, Presiding Officer. I wonder, I'd be grateful for your advice in terms of how uh, we clarify the assertion made by Mr Finlay uh, that, par uh, that I uh, misled this Parliament uh, by uh, making clear that part of the minutes of that uh, meeting of the 22nd of February that Mr Finlay did not read out states... It was agreed that when the future nature of the service is more certain, it will be helpful to get clear direction and guidance from the Scottish Government. Presiding officer, I have given that clear direction and guidance. The halt will not be lifted, and I can see no circumstances in which it will. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the, the point of order did give you the opportunity to put that on the record. Um, unfortunately, because the member uh, used the wrong language, used very inappropriate language, he was expelled, which didn't allow uh, you to make the response during the procedure that you should be allowed to do. And I would urge the member who is not here to reflect on his behaviour because it doesn't do the argument any favours whatsoever. Now we turn to decision time. The first question this evening is that motion 17892 in the name of Kevin Stewart on the working group on tenement maintenance be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 17922 in the name of Aileen Campbell on appointments to the Poverty and Inequality Commission be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, I propose to ask a single question on the six uh, parliamentary bureau motions. Does anyone object? No, that's good. The question therefore is that motions 17939 
to 17944 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 17945 in the name of Graham Day on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 17945 in the name of Graham Day is yes, 83, no, 26. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move on shortly to members' business in the name of Keith Brown on the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights Report. But we'll just take a few moments for members and the Minister to change seats. <laughs>